Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Hope everyone out there is safe and well. Been some flooding, more flooding here, a lot of rain here in Oklahoma, and so I've been working outside a lot, but I have managed to um, get enough words together here to bring this Freedom in Christ series to its conclusion. And, uh, as usual, I just want to emphasize, stress, heavily stress the fact that I do not ask anyone to agree with me on anything whatsoever. Now, uh, uh, when times get very difficult, as they are now, or just in general, and, and they will come in your life if they haven't yet. There is nothing, nothing that equals uh, or compares to the Word of God. Over and over in my videos, I have emphasized the importance of God's Word as opposed to what man invents on his own, out of his own imagination. The day may come, folks, when when you will realize that you could have spent time in this Word. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to lay a guilt trip on anybody here. I'm just simply stating a fact. The time could come when you don't have that time and and you don't have the opportunity, so buy up every opportunity that you have to make this book a part of your life. God says that He magnified all of His words above His name. That He's branded your names on the palms of His hands. That He'll never ever cease to sustain and uphold you. That He knows the way that you take. And that after you have been tested, you shall... You shall, not might, but you shall come forth as gold. He doesn't say that you may or may not be tested. You will be. I have no idea what lies ahead uh, in history. Any student of the Scriptures realizes that times aren't going to get better. They're going to get worse. And folks, I want you to know His Word. The purpose of this ministry is to drive you into the Scriptures. So let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful again that You've granted us the privilege. The privilege, the opportunity to feast upon Your Word over these past few years. It's our constant prayer that Your Word be so settled in our hearts. Your Word is a lamp to our feet. It's a light unto our path. And oh, how precious Your Word is. May the Holy Spirit be our teacher, guiding us, directing us, enlightening us to the truth of Your Word, filtering out all of the error, all the foolishness. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, it's, it's with a little bit of sadness that, that I, I come to the end of this uh, short little series on our freedom in Christ. The honest truth, folks, is that it could go on forever. There really is no starting point, no stopping place. Just because of the very nature of the subject itself. In, 
many of you followed us uh, through Colossians. And in, it, in our study through that epistle, we learned that our continuing in the faith is not dependent upon our doing anything but that it's the fact that you're reconciled that you continue in the faith. Your continuing in the faith is grounded in the fact that God reconciled you to Himself. If you are reconciled, you will continue in the faith. Faithful is He who calls you who also will do it. We, we learned that we were sometimes, at one time, we were alienated. We were enemies in our minds by wicked works. Yet now has He reconciled in the body of His flesh through, through death to present us holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. If ye continue in the faith, and you will, it's a, it's a present, active, indicative, it's a first-class condition since you will continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, in which case you were never reconciled. If you continue and you will, and this having to do with our reconciliation guaranteeing, assuring our Continuing in the faith. Therefore, therefore, looking at John chapter 8, verse 31. John 8, 31. The subjects there are not reconciliation in faith. Take note of the fact that in those few verses, the three or four verses that follow that, too. It's not about reconciliation and faith, but, the, but about the, His Word and our being a learner of that Word. A pupil. Disciples. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him. These were not non-believing Jews. If ye abide, that is, continue in My Word, the Word, then are ye My disciples. The word there means pupil, a learner. Then are ye My disciples indeed. If you continue, and that is the subjunctive mood of uncertainty, we're not looking at it, the indicative mood, we're not looking at the mood of, of certainty here, we're looking at the subjunctive mood. If you continue, maybe you will, maybe you won't. If you continue in my word, truly, you'll be my disciples. You'll, indeed, you'll, you will be my disciples. You'll be my pupils. And you shall know, and that word know there is gnosko. It's experiential knowledge. It's not oida. It's not the word for perfect knowledge. It is experiential knowledge. You shall experientially, in the future, it's a future tense, experientially know the truth, and the truth shall make you all, plural, in the future, free will set you free. will set all of you free is what the Greek says. That's what it says. Folks, that is a marvelous verse. It's, it is exactly opposite of what the human mind thinks. Note, I want you to note, take careful note that he does not say that you will be believers, you'll be saints, that you'll be my sheep, they're already believers. What he says is, he says, disciples, pupils, learners. And it's in the subjunctive mood. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now he's saying this to believers. 
And I don't know how many times throughout my life I have heard Christians quote those words as if those words are referring to an, uh, an unregenerate person. If he will just come and do something to be redeemed, then he shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Folks, that's not what the text is saying. I pointed out in my first video that, that uh, we saw that we are called, we are called free, as free, 1 Peter 2.16. Galatians 5.13, called to freedom. Galatians 5.1, Christ hath made us free. Okay? Well, Steve, seems like you've got a slight contradiction going on here. And I can hear the question right now. Steve, if, if the text, if, if so many verses say that we have been made free, then how is it that Christ is saying that we shall, maybe we, maybe we will, maybe we won't know the truth and the truth shall set us free? The simple answer to that, folks, has to do with context. He's not talking about reconciliation and continuance in the faith. He's talking about becoming a disciple, a learner, a pupil. If we continue in His Word, we will know the truth and the truth will make us free in our experience. That's why we, we see the word know there as gnosko, experiential knowledge. We will have an experiential knowledge of the truth in which we have been made free. They've been made free. The question is whether they will have an experiential knowledge of that, of that truth that they have been made free in Christ. Oh, you Christians, you know, you, you know, you don't smoke, you don't drink, you don't play poker, you know, you don't gamble, you don't dance, you don't watch uh, the Beverly Hillbillies on TV. You know, you don't watch movies, you don't fish or hunt on Sunday. You know, I, I don't know what your big ten are. Every Christian has these personal convictions. And we compare our own with those held by others. And the idea of the human mind is, is if I become a Christian, I have to give up all these things that I like. Therefore, Christianity is bondage. Being free from the truth is freedom. And here Christ says you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. You do not go to heaven because of your works. You don't go to heaven for helping the poor. You don't go to heaven for being kind and compassionate. You go to heaven for one reason and one reason only, and that is if, if, because Jesus Christ died in your place. I don't care whether you accept it, believe it, receive it as truth. None of that has anything to do with it. If you want to be biblical, folks, your redemption is based on Jesus Christ dying in your place. You can't find one verse of Scripture, not one, that says that you're redeemed by something that you do. If you just do something, Christ will redeem you. Not one verse. Christians will sing, you know, they'll sing, I repented and won the victory. Now, maybe you can sing that. I can't. It's not only not biblical, it's actually it's blasphemy. Nobody biblically can stand up and tell you that by repenting, you won the victory. That, you know, that, well, Christ started the process, but by golly, you know, they've finished it. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, the, the problem with the human mind is seen in, in the text here. They answered him, and they said, they said basically, you know, now wait a minute, we're already free. We're free now. Okay? You know, we're Abraham's seed, and we were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Never in bondage. Really. 
Really? How could they say that? Bondage in Egypt, then they were in bondage in the wilderness, and they finally got out of there, and they had some, some 80 years, pretty good deal, you know, under David and Solomon. Then they soon got in trouble. They, they wound up in, in bondage in Babylon. Now they're in bondage to Rome, and the modern Christian community today has out legalized the legalism of Israel. Modern Christianity exalts man. He's got to receive. He's got to believe. He's got to repent. Very, very little real discussion about what Christ actually did. If you've stepped into church lately, you know that. You know that. Very little about what Christ actually did. And if there is, he's got to believe that, that, that Christ did it for him. And, and we make it all about man. You know, man, he's, he's the captain of his ship. He's the one who determines his destiny, not God Almighty. When the very man it is preaching to, to do something to be redeemed, is in absolute bondage. If you don't know Jesus Christ, folks, if He did not die in your place, then you're in bondage to sin, which is the opposite of freedom. That is all that the carnal man can do is sin. Even the worship of, of the wicked is sin. The plowing of the wicked is sin. Everything he does is sin. Even his worship is sin. That means he's in bondage to sin. Sin is the owner. He's the slave. He's in bondage to the, to the condemnation. He's in bondage to the penalty of the law. And he's in bondage to the authority of men. I've gone over this so many times. I want you to understand the biblical truth of a totally depraved man. Spiritually dead. Folks, it is utter foolishness to say to a totally depraved man, one who is spiritually dead, accept Christ, believe, receive, repent, and you'll be, and you'll be saved. Utter folly. John 3, 5, the Lord Jesus Christ says that the carnal man cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Can't do it. John 6, 44, he says no man can come unto him unless he's forced to come. And there isn't anything that you can do with that text to make it read anything else. The modern church has so been infiltrated with the doctrines of legalism, they teach that, that no man can come unless he's invited. And that, again, puts the sovereignty back on man. The modern church, without exception, and, and almost every seminary teaches to some degree the sovereignty of man. Folks, man is not sovereign. The unregenerate man is in abject bondage, in total slavery. Regenerate man is a new creation with the will of God. In neither case is, is man ever sovereign. He doesn't control his destiny. If you're wealthy, God gave you that ability. If you're poor, it's the way the Lord wants you to be. How many Christians look at their present state and say, I am absolutely content in the state in which God has me? Not many. I spend hours in this book every day, and I read of the peace that passes understanding and the joy that's unspeakable and the, and, and the rest that's there. And I talk with Christians day after day that don't know rest, that don't know peace. Here is what is true. You can be reconciled where you will continue in the faith because you were reconciled and not be a learner, a pupil, a disciple who is made free in your experience but live in bondage. Here's what's not true. 
if a, if a totally depraved man in bondage who doesn't know Christ does something to be redeemed, he will know the truth and the truth will set him free. That is not true. Yet that is what modern evangelism proclaims. I've devoted three years of my life telling you people two things. What I just said and don't agree with anything I say. That is all I can do. I'm not obligated to go beyond that. John 8, 43, they have absolutely no ability to hear His Word. Modern Christianity is preaching the Word of God as, as if anyone has the ability to hear it, which is a perversion of the Word of God when they have no ability to even hear the true gospel unless it is granted unto them to hear. But it makes a difference what you're preaching. Okay? I, I can hear people out there right now say, Oh, Steve, yeah, you know, that, okay, that must be true. That, let's, let's just suppose that that's true, that what you're saying is true. But, you know, we've we got to preach it to all men. Well, my question is, what, is you, what are you preaching to all men? What are you preaching? That's my question. Are you preaching what man must do to become redeemed, which is not biblical? Or are you preaching what Christ has done for, for those who are redeemed, for those whom He redeemed? That is, those are the individuals who will have ears to hear, and they will hear. They will hear. You don't have... Folks, you can go the rest of your life never worrying about the fact that some person is not going to be saved, and especially not having to worry about, well, they're not going to be saved. The reason why some people are going to go to hell is because I didn't do enough. I didn't, I didn't preach enough. Because I didn't tell them about Christ. Folks, you are carrying a burden that God never equipped nor intended you to bear. His people will hear. His people will believe. His people will do so because He's redeemed them. Because they are His people. They're His sheep. Why don't we take God at His word? Why? Why don't we do that? They cannot hear because they don't have the ability to hear. He who hears God's word is of God. John 8, 47. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. The text couldn't be any, any, any more clear. If you're God's child, you hear God's word. If you're not God's child, you don't. John 14, 17. The world cannot receive the Holy Spirit, but you do because He dwells in you. And that, that's something. That's really something, to receive somebody already dwelling in you. Modern Christianity says if you receive Him, then He'll dwell in you. And he's already dwelling. That's why you're receiving. Romans chapter 8, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. 1 Corinthians 2.14, a natural man can't receive the things of the Spirit of God. Yet modern Christianity beseeches the natural man to receive the things of God. 2 Peter 2.14 He can't cease sinning. Romans 3.11 There is none that even seeketh after God. Oh, if you'll just seek after Him. Folks, how did we stray so far from this book? And what does all this have to do, Steve, with a wonderful series of videos on our freedom in Christ? Everything. Everything. 
Folks, these Jews who believed in him thought that they were free, yet they're in bondage. You, you want to you wanna hear something odd, really odd? Here's something really strange. The natural man thinks that if he were a Christian, he'd be in bondage. You know, all those do's and don'ts, no thanks. The believer thinks that if he lives a Christian life based on human merit, he won't be in bondage. They deliberately place themselves in bondage thinking that they are free while promising liberty to those who would just live in bondage like they're doing. How many Christians realize that God isn't cleaning up the old man? Not many. Not many at all. Very few, in fact. Most believers today are whitewashing it, trying to make it better and better in their weak way. Weak, pathetic way. Oh, I'm really trying, Steve. I, I really am. Oh, day after day, I, you know, I get just a little more sanctified. I, I get a little more holy every day. Because I'm, I'm really working hard at it. And I tell them, I tell them what this book says, that they are as fully righteous as Jesus Christ, holy, unblameable, unreprovable in His sight, that their new man can't sin, and a hundred other verses of solid biblical truth concerning who they are in Christ, and yet I still hear, well, yeah, he sure started it, Steve. I, he started it, but I'm, but I gotta, I gotta, I gotta finish it. I, and I'm working hard at it. You know, I don't sin as much today as I did a year ago, which I find really strange because I do. I think one of the greatest shocks in my life was to read Lewis Sperry Chafer, who wrote volumes on on systematic theology well-respected theologian who said that when he was when he was 83 years old said he said that the sins of the flesh were greater at 83 than they were at 19 folks your old man is not getting any better and the fact is whether you want to believe it or not is that modern christianity today's their its primary focus is on trying to make better what is only getting worse. How many people are telling you this? I'm going to tell you this. Yeah, it's a lonely walk, folks. It is. God intended it, that it be. What do you want for your life? You want to, you want to go the broad way? Do you want to follow the masses? Or do you want to walk the narrow way and stick to the truth of this book no matter what other people say? That's the greatest challenge you'll ever have in this life that you live here. Verse 35, And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. The servant is not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. Your old man is the slave of sin, and it won't abide in the house forever. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You, you ought to shout hallelujah at that verse. People want the old man to abide forever because they know nothing about the new man. They want the unregenerate to abide forever. That is not what the verse says. You and your old man were a slave of sin. We were crucified with Christ. When Jesus Christ died in your place, He made you a new creation. A new creation. Well, how good is, is it? I guess it? Well, I guess it depends on how good a job you think Christ did. My Bible says it was perfect. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. For his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin. He has no ability to sin. That's the new man. The new creation that's born of God. 
That's the one that abides forever. The new man that his seed, Jesus Christ, abides in. Galatians 3.16 Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Not seeds, plural, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. You know, people love quoting John 3.16, but they seem to know little about Galatians 3.16. You ought to do a study sometime on all the 3.16s. God seems to love 316s. And with that, folks, I have to end this series on our freedom in Christ and move on to Titus verse by verse. Folks, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, thanks for watching.